viewers. Ancient Rome, one of the greatest superpowers in history, whose far-reaching legacy continues to shape our lives. For close on a thousand years, the Romans dominated the known world. Theirs was an extraordinary empire that heralded an age of unprecedented prosperity and stability, but that also ruled through violence and oppression. Rome's rise to greatness wasn't inevitable. Its epic history was often decided by single critical moments. In this series, I'm exploring eight key days that I believe help to explain Rome's remarkable success. To understand the full significance of these eight days, I'm traveling across the Roman world. I am incredibly lucky to get access to this archeological site. Examining remarkable finds. We have molten glass from that day, that exact time when Boudicca attacked the city. <laughs> and investigating the complexities of what it was to be Roman. One of the days I've chosen happened here in Britain around 60 AD. It was the day when Roman forces flogged and dishonored the queen of a proud native tribe. I am Boudicca. And it triggered an uprising, the likes of which Rome had never seen. This day reveals how fragile Rome's grip was on its empire and the lengths it would go to to keep control. Rome, the settlement that fought, bought and plundered its way to become the most powerful empire in the world. Rome had risen to become a Mediterranean superpower after crushing Hannibal's Carthage. Victory for Rome! Led by an omnipotent emperor, Rome's hunger for land was ferocious, and it spread outward, consuming the territories that surrounded it. To those it conquered, Rome brought security, education, sanitation, technology, even a form of welfare. Rome's genius was that she managed to get her defeated enemies to buy into the Roman project, giving people across three continents in Europe, Asia and Africa a sense of belonging, of being part of something greater than themselves. But not everyone wanted to be a cog in the well-oiled Roman machine. And sometimes Rome had to resort to extreme brutality to maintain control. On a single day, around 60 AD, here in Britain, that brutality backfired spectacularly. Rome's violent flogging of a native queen was intended to crush her people into submission. Instead, it sparked an unprecedented outburst of civil strife and rebellion that would spread across Britain. The leader of the revolt was Boudicca, still a British icon today, a proud symbol of resistance against injustice. And I'd argue that the day that Rome humiliated her is critical to our understanding of the Roman story because it shows that not everyone bought into the grand idea that was Rome. And it helps us to see things from the other side, to get a sense of what it was like to live under Roman rule. 43 AD. 17 years before Boudicca's flogging. By now, the Roman Empire under Claudius had spread right across Europe, even over the Channel, to the enigmatic island of Britannia. But keeping control of such a vast empire required a delicate balancing act. Rome used the carrot as well as the stick to get local rulers on board. Rulers of tribes like the Iceni, home to a young noblewoman who'd one day face the dark side of Roman rule, Boudicca. So you want us to bow down before your emperor in Rome? And you want me to keep my people from cutting off your balls? And in return, in return, you keep your throne, you keep your lands. We'll give you military protection. And I have a gift from the emperor. 
Open it. You think we can be bought with gold? No. But I think you can recognize good terms when you're offered them. Spying on us? No. Hear anything interesting? I don't trust the Romans. Boudicca's tribe, the Iceni, allied with Rome. It was just one of a patchwork of small independent tribal kingdoms that made up Britannia in 43 AD. This is Warham Camp in East Anglia, an Iceni stronghold for at least a hundred years before the Romans arrived. Now, it might not look like much from down here, but if you look from above, you get a sense of just how impressive this place was 2,000 years ago. These ramparts were built as defences against constant attacks from neighbouring tribes. The fact that the tribes of Britain were often at one another's throats was great news for Rome. 1800 years before the word mafia had been invented, the Romans had set up a kind of massive protection racket right across the empire. They would promise to protect a particular tribe in return for cooperation and loyalty and good behavior. For many leaders, this was an offer they couldn't refuse. And the native Britons were no different. In all, 11 of 17 British kingdoms became allies of Rome including the Iceni, who'd one day come to regret that decision. We know from the great Roman author Tacitus, whose father-in-law was actually stationed here in Britannia, that one of the tribes, the Brigantes, was actually ruled by a woman, Queen Cartamandua. Now, Queen Cartamandua had handed over her territory as a client kingdom to Rome. It meant that she could still rule, but she had to submit to Rome's authority. This is a rain ring from a chariot, and it is decorated. Dr Julia really Farley subtle. is a leading expert in Iron Age Britain. It is a fascinating situation because for Romans, women should very definitely be second-class citizens. They're not expected to wield real political power. So how do they react to what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to read the sources we have about, like, Queen Cartamandua because, um, obviously, she's an ally of the Romans and so they're, they're actually talking about her quite negatively. Um, Tacitus talks about her being treacherous and cunning and self-indulgent because he doesn't really approve of, you know, a woman holding power in that way and how she behaves. So I think it's really kind of difficult for the Romans because they need like powerful leaders like Cartamandua on side. That's how they're controlling these areas of the, the provinces. So they're having to make this adjustment to deal with her, even though she's a powerful woman. I mean, there obviously are things that really appeal to the native Britons, that, that it can be a very good deal to sign up to the Roman project. I mean, for someone like Cartamandua, this is really in some ways a no-brainer because her ability to be supported by the Romans makes her more important, not kind of, you know, a, a weak leader who's sided with the enemy, but a powerful woman who's got these connections that span all across Europe. We're constantly finding evidence of how the native Britons, particularly the posh ones, cozied up to the Romans. Um, the A1 road in the north of England at Scotch Corner was recently widened and during the building work, archaeologists rescued these fantastic treasures, 177,000 of them, dating from the time of the Roman occupation. Now, tellingly, this territory was originally Queen Cartumandua's heartland, and time and time again, we find that these beautiful artefacts have a distinctly Roman flavor. This evidence appears to show how an alliance with Rome could be very beneficial, even for women. But Romans had a word for the people of Britain. Britonculi. Pathetic little Brits. And 2,000 miles from Britain, evidence has been uncovered that reveals what Romans really thought of their remote province. Here in Aphrodisias, modern southwest Turkey, 
we can see the true face of the imperial vision. These are sculptures from the Sebasteion, or Monument to Emperors, a collection of around 80 pieces of imperial propaganda. And here we can see how Rome portrayed its conquest of Britannia to the rest of the empire. You know, I think this is one of the most disturbing images from across antiquity. What you're looking at is the Emperor Claudius triumphantly dominating a naked woman. Britannia. This tells us a huge amount, both about Rome's attitude to its new province, but also about its attitude to women. It is merciless, it's misogynist, and it's also a chilling foreshadowing of what was to come, of that day when Rome's dismissive attitude to women would come back to haunt it. By 47 AD, four years after the invasion, great swathes of Britannia had signed up to the Roman project, seduced by the opportunities offered by the empire. Rome's domination over Britannia included most of the south and east. As well as the Iceni, there were the Trinovantes, also in East Anglia, and the Brigantes in the north, with rebels fleeing to Wales. Subject tribes were expected to adopt new laws and customs, in keeping with the rest of the empire. One of Rome's demands would prove particularly hard to swallow for one of its loyal client kingdoms. People of Iceni, the carrying of weapons is now prohibited. All weapons must be surrendered. Failure to surrender your weapons will be treated as a violation of your privileges. For Boudicca and the Iceni, swords were an integral part of their tribal culture, an important symbol of status. I offer you my sword. This is a mistake. Boudicca would soon see what happened if you dared to defy Rome. Rome came down hard on the Iceni, quickly crushing their rebellion. The message to the client kingdoms of Britannia was clear. Stay in line or pay the price. We don't know what happened to their king, but we do know that despite the rebellion, the Romans still allowed the Iceni to be ruled by one of their own. On the condition that they gave up their precious swords, the new client king that would have to carry out Rome's demands was Prasutagus, Boudicca's husband. What should I say to the tribe? It's not what you say that matters. It's what you do. Under Prasutagus, the Iceni surrendered their weapons and, for now, were left to their own devices under Rome's watchful eye. The king keeps his sword.
The legacy of the new opportunities for trade opened up by the Roman occupation is still with us today. At its heart, the new town of Londinium. Romans and locals rubbed shoulders and made money. In 2010, an incredible discovery in London's financial heart revealed much about what mattered to its early inhabitants. The Romans and natives living here left behind some writing tablets. These are the most remarkable finds, aren't they? Yes, they're wonderful voices from the remote past. And it's, it's wonderful they survived over 1900 years. This is writing literacy coming to Britain. So do we get a hint from these of the, of the kinds of jobs that people are doing and what their life was like in, in Londinium, for instance? Well, we've got scraps of it. We're getting these random glimpses of largely a business community in London. Um, we've got a nice example over here. Um, this is the man. It starts in mid-sentence, per forum totum glorianta. They're boasting through the whole marketplace that you have lent them money at interest. Clearly, this is money that has been lent to a rather uncreditworthy recipient, and they're boasting the fact they've actually got the money. And basically, this does seem to be um, a wheeler-dealer, carpet-bagging business community. These tablets show that under Rome, Britannia was thriving, becoming a literate, Latin-speaking, connected society. But a change in leadership in Rome would threaten this new civilization. The conquering Emperor Claudius died in 54 AD, and his great-nephew, the infamous Nero, took control. For Nero, the provinces of Rome were all about lining his pockets. This greed would put Boudicca on a collision course with Rome. One man was instrumental in triggering the events that led to that confrontation. Nero's procurator, or chief revenue officer, Catus Decianus. An ambitious man, he was keen to show Nero how profitable Britannia could be under his management. What news? Prasutagus is dead. I, King Prasutagus of the Iceni, hereby declare that in the event of my death, I will. <laughs> Very Roman. In the event of my death, Half my kingdom shall pass to the Emperor of Rome, and half I bequeath to my two daughters. Thank you. What Decianus does next will shatter the peace and tear the province of Britannia apart. I believe this is the day that we see the true face of Rome. to pay your respects, Roman. This land now belongs to Rome. You will all serve the Emperor. All royal property will be handed over to me. No, my husband left a will. Sadly, the kingdom wasn't his to give. Certainly not the two elves. You insult his memory. Stand aside. Get your... Filthy Roman feet off our sacred land. Take everything, flock her, rape them, and leave all three of them alive. No, no, no. don't touch my girl. No, no, don't touch my girl. No, 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 don't touch my girl. <laughs> The outrage against Boudicca and her daughters was disgusting. It was a horrific, invasive, personal attack. But it was more than that, too. 
It was the dishonoring of a queen and the disgrace of her people. This was Rome using rape as a weapon of war. And for many millions of so-called barbarians, the Peregrini, the foreigners who lived under Roman military occupation, this must have been the stark reality, the savage face of Roman control. We will make them pay. Boudicca's revenge for this day will cost the Empire dear. Rome's brutal violation of Boudicca and her two daughters was a grave mistake for the Empire. No doubt the Romans thought that the humiliated and now leaderless Iceni would collapse and surrender. It was another page out of the Roman conquest notebook, absorbing a kingdom once a client king had died. I'm sure the very last thing that they expected was for a woman to take control. But as we've seen with Cartamandua, for the native Britons, there was zero problem accepting female leadership. Boudicca knew the Iceni wouldn't be able to fight the Romans alone. She'd need to convince rival tribes to join her cause. She first approached her nearest neighbors, the Trinovantes. I am Boudicca, queen of the Iceni. I've come to speak with your king. We have no king. Rome is our king now. The Iceni will no longer take orders from Rome. We will drive them out. We will fight them, but we need weapons. I know you haven't given over all your swords. Who says so? You seem unable or unwilling to take them up yourself. So hand them over to us. We would be happy to do your work for you. Why should we hand our swords over to you? If you don't give them to us, we will take them. Or you could take them up yourselves and fight the Romans alongside us. If, though, as I say, you have no use for them. Quiet. I'm thinking. Boudicca offered the Trinovantes an opportunity. <laughs> Before the Romans arrived, the Trinovantes were considered the most powerful tribe in Britain, and they had special reason to hate the Romans. It was here, right in the heart of the Trinovantes' tribal land, that the Romans had built their provincial capital. Camilla Dunham, now Colchester. 
It had come to house a military garrison, and the farmland all around had been dished out to Roman veterans, uh, part of a retirement package after 25 years of service in the legions. Boudicca had played this to her advantage, harnessing the festering fury of the Trinovantes and gaining a crucial ally in the fight with Rome. Makes me sick to my stomach. Their temple, to their emperor, that we paid for. What you're looking at here is the remains of a Norman castle. But originally, there was a much bigger building on this site. All these bits of red brick were part of a Roman temple dedicated to the Emperor Claudius who'd been deified, turned into a god after his death. Uh, pretty much standard practice for emperors. This giant temple was even taller than the building that's here now. And it was a real focal point for the city. It wasn't just a place of religious importance where animal sacrifices were made. Um, it doubled up as a meeting place where money was lent and where people traded goods. In 2016, hidden under modern Colchester, archaeologists discovered clues that revealed the astonishing scale of the temple complex. So explain to me what it is I'm looking at here. Well, you're looking at the remains of this massive monumental arcade. It's called an arcade because it's a series of arches. Uh -huh. Temple of Claudius is the largest classical style temple that we know of in Britain. And this is the big, huge arcade forming the front of it. So you'd pass through the centre of this arcade to get into this public space and to access the temple. And what we see here is the core, the remains of this support for two arches. This would have gone up a total of eight metres and then split to form two arches. Uh -huh. And one would have come down to the remains of the next support over there. OK, so, the, so the, where that little second block yes. is. And do we know in the original how many arches there'd have been in total? We calculate there would have been 26 arches in all. Because that's really and it would have been big, a, isn't it? And it would have been 120 metres long. That's enormous. I mean, it's a huge it's, structure, then, it, this. It is ginormous. Amazing. Yes. Archaeologists have created a computer reconstruction showing the vast scale of the arcade surrounding the temple. It was unlike anything else in Europe, and its purpose would have been solely to impress anyone who saw it. For the locals, I mean, this would be completely alien, really intimidating. Well, it must have been like a spaceship had landed in a big field for most of them. Yeah. So it was very intimidating. This was Rome proclaiming its absolute power, just as it did the day it flogged Boudicca and raped her daughters. For the locals, it was a daily reminder of their oppression. And now the people of Colchester, both Romans and native Britons alike, were about to feel the heat of that simmering resentment. Run! 
The day that Rome flogged Boudicca was intended to crush her. Instead, she unleashed an onslaught of fire and fury that left thousands of Romans and native Britons dead. Down here is all that's left of the Temple of Claudius. And these are the original foundations. And up above, for two days, the petrified surviving inhabitants were barricaded in as Boudicca's army systematically ransacked the town, house by house. For years, we've relied on the historian Tacitus's writings for a description of Boudicca's fiery vengeance. But recently, there have been some truly remarkable discoveries that not only support Tacitus's accounts, but also give us incredible evidence of what happened here. We have brilliant written accounts of this event. How good is the archaeology for it? Through the burning, we have some material as a kind of snapshot from that day, that exact time when Boudicca attacked the city. Amazing. It's, it's this kind of brilliant irony, isn't it, that that destruction actually saves history for us. Yes, like examples of Samian ware that were reduced to this dark black colour. Amazing. Glass was reduced to these molten fragments. It's kind of hideous, in a way, holding this and thinking of the suffering that would have accompanied this. You know, there, you can feel the heat of Boudicca's fury. Yes. And in 2014, they uncovered a larder and they found lots of foods that people would have been eating at yeah. the time. So you have the burnt lentils here. Yeah. And here's the modern equivalent. Amazing. And then dates, which, of course, would have been incredibly exotic then. Yes, they would have been. I can safely say this is the first time in my life I've ever held a 2,000-year-old date. <laughs> well, yes. Possibly the last yes. as well. And was it just food that survived there? Or was, it, was there anything else? Well, in the no, actually. Buried beneath this mundane daily material were an exceptional collection of jewellery items. When Boudicca attacked the town, whoever was living in the household at the time acted in pure desperation. They found all of their most precious items and they decided to hide them underneath the floor. Oh, it's heavy. It is. Gold is very heavy, yeah, but it's yeah. such a large, large item. It is quite weighty. And so lovely to hold it. That's absolutely beautiful, beautiful piece. We don't have any traces of who they were. This is the one snapshot we have of their life. Mm. But it does have that close personal story that does make it even more exciting. So this is a history-making, game-changing moment, and our evidence, as well as the gold, is, is a burnt date. It is, yes, exactly. It is sobering, thinking of the death and destruction that would have been suffered here. Archaeologists tell us that not a single building was left standing. Boudicca had embarked on a war of annihilation. Word of the carnage spread, inspiring more disaffected natives to choose their countrymen rather than Romans as allies. Decianus realised he'd underestimated Boudicca. He dispatched the 9th Legion, a unit of around 5,000 battle-hardened soldiers to deal with her. He also sent word to the Roman governor of Britannia, Suetonius Paulinus, who was crushing rebel forces in North Wales. Paulinus left Wales and raced to Londinium to organise a defence. What's this I hear, Decianus? Rome humiliated by an army of illiterate half-breeds led by a woman? I sent the Night Legion. Well, that's all that's left of the Night Legion. And Borica is marching on Londinium. Are you ready for her, Decianus? Because you don't look ready. And I suspect the Emperor will have you executed for this debacle. Boudicca's defeat of the 9th Legion would have shocked the Romans. General Paulinus knew he couldn't defend London with the few men he had with him. 
Our details of what happened next are pretty sketchy, but one thing is certain, Decianus did not hang around. When he heard that Boudicca's army was advancing on London, he slipped onto a boat and sailed across the channel where he disappears from history. Boudicca and her rapidly growing army descended on Londinium and destroyed it. If you weren't with her, you were against her, Roman and pro-Roman Britons alike. She was said to have cut the breasts off women and sewn them into their own mouths. Boudicca's following continued to grow as she swept on to Verulanium, St Albans, and burnt it. Three towns in ashes, thousands dead. General Paulinus, united with his army in Wales, headed south in a desperate attempt to crush the rebellion. The empire relied on its reputation of military invincibility. Paulinus couldn't afford to be driven out of Britannia, particularly by a woman. Oh. Mars help us all. Boudicca's rebellion had united tribes across the southeast against the Romans. At an unidentified place, probably in the West Midlands, Boudicca's army, now in the tens of thousands, came face to face with General Paulinus and his small force of 10,000 Roman legionaries. This was Boudicca's chance to drive Rome from Britannia's shores. The confrontation would come to be called the Battle of Watling Street. I thought there'd be more of them. What? What is it? I have a bad feeling, Basito. No, you don't. Because of you, we have these numbers. We stand united for the first time against a common enemy. You do not have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> no! Sounds like there are more women and children than men. Keep your soldiers together. And on my word, advance and don't stop. Boudicca's forces outnumbered the Romans by perhaps as many as three or four to one, but they'd never met a disciplined Roman army in full combat before. Everything hinged on this confrontation. <laughs> the size of Boudicca's army actually began to work in Rome's favour. As the rebels surged forward, those at the front were crushed against an immovable wall of Roman shields. And then they faced Roman blades. Boudicca's warriors were no match for the dreadful efficiency of the Romans. They were either crushed or slaughtered without mercy. 
Tacitus tells us that 80,000 native Britons died and just 400 Romans. Even given the doubtless exaggeration, this was a total shattering defeat. According to Tacitus, Boudicca took poison as her army was defeated. But that's actually a literary cliche of the time. Defeated generals commit suicide, women take poison. Think of Cleopatra, killed by the venom of an asp. It's actually more likely that Boudicca fell on the battlefield, where Britannia's hopes of freedom from Rome also died. Boudicca became a legendary figure for Rome, a kind of uber woman. She was described as having tawny hair down to her hips and flashing eyes and a strident voice and being immensely tall. Basically, in order to explain her successes, the Romans had to turn her into an anti-superhero. The day of Boudicca's flogging the rape of her daughters and the revolt it unleashed ultimately led to the very opposite of what she'd fought for. For the next 350 years, most of Britain was part of a vast intercontinental superstate, the Roman Empire, and its legacy is still felt today. Literacy, Christianity, the power of the pen were all brought here to Britain, a shortening of the Latin word Britannia, by the Romans. Although Boudicca couldn't reverse the occupation, she did win a place in history, a symbol so potent that 2,000 years on, she's still a household name. Boudicca was troubling to the Romans, proof that a mere woman could get them on the run, and that there were those who refused to be cowed by Roman force or wooed by the delights of Roman ways. A reminder that the human spirit is not easily broken and that the idea that was Rome had its limits. Next time, Rome's most notorious emperor, Nero, drives the empire into a crisis. What have you done? To order the murder of your own mother was unprecedented. His downfall would bring an end to Rome's first dynasty. And Bethany Hughes will be back next week with more Roman revelations. And there's ex more explosive action from the Romans tomorrow night, as over on Five Star, Kit Harrington and Emily Browning star in the movie Pompeii. Coming up, the discovery of the world's oldest stone monument causes archaeologists to rethink the origins of man. The Garden of Eden revealed is new. Next.